So I would love to talk to you tonight, and, it, and I have to say, it is always a privilege to be up here because I don't take it lightly what influence this is. Having the microphone and standing in front of you all and getting this time is not something that is uh, a time filler or, uh, well, oh, look, it's just my turn. It's, it, it isn't that for me. Not that I'm saying that anybody else is. I'm just literally saying that, <laughs> shoot, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that I need you to know the privilege I feel being up here. And so when you see me before service and I look like a stressed out little, you know, busy bee, it's because I'm filled with anticipation. I'm filled with anticipation of what God wants to do. Because my whole purpose of being up here is literally just to be his mouthpiece and not get in the way. I might add my few little jokes to, you know, if I see some of you nodding off on me, but hey, <laughs> it's uh, literally just because I, I love the privilege of getting to share Jesus. It is what brings me life, is talking about Jesus. I discovered that when I used to, uh, so I'm originally from Canada, if you didn't know that, you won't be able to tell by an accent because I don't have one anymore, but, uh, well, 16 years in Oroville, we'll do it to you. <laughs> and so I remember I was working in uh, a Christian private school it, back when I was a young adult, <laughs> a while back, uh, and I was a female house parent for the students that boarded there. And so we had a lot of Asian students, and I was also the activities coordinator, which was great, except none of them really liked to do the activities I planned which was a bummer, right? Because I had to go through the whole rigmarole of like, okay, I have to reserve the bus, get the bus driver, okay, call ahead to paintball and reserve the time and how many students we've got and make sure they've got all their stuff and we're good to go. And then like a couple hours beforehand, they're all, no, we don't want to. I know. Needless to say, when I finally got them out there, it was... <laughs> I felt so bad. One of them was a referee coming at me, and I was like, oh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, uh, all that to say, so it's a lot of different backgrounds there, right? And so I'm and one of the evenings while they're on study hall, I'm sitting there talking, and, and one of the students asks me about, well, why is Christianity any different than Buddhism or any of the other religions? And I was like, oh, boy, because I'm, I'm not well-versed on all the other religions, but, oh, what I know what I know is Jesus. So I just started sharing about Jesus and being like, hey, what other things bring it back to the center point of love? And they couldn't deny. And I was like, I walked away from that, uh, that conversation with them being like, I could die right now. I'm so happy. And I realized, oh, this is what I'm made for. This is what makes me come alive is sharing Jesus. And so in that, it's this moment for each of us that we need to actually put ourselves in positions to have the moment to go open your mouth and give what you have, right? It's so encouraging for us at, in, in our world today, they need to hear what you have. And you don't have to wait for a moment like this to have the honor and the privilege to, to give that love away, right? It's, uh, it's really, really important for us to get good at sharing why we love Jesus. Okay, that was a freebie. All right, so what I really want to talk about, <laughs> maybe, maybe that was the Holy Spirit softening you up, because I want to talk about uh, truth and conviction. <laughs> See what I mean? All right, that was softening you all up. <laughs> uh, okay, so in looking at what is truth, in today's world, it is a mishmash. I mean... <sighs> I could get started, but I won't, because that's just a waste of time. Uh, there's a, so much confusion. Yes, agreed, confusion. Craziness, we need to know what truth is. And so I like to go back to what does Jesus say for truth? So first John, nope, nope, first point, John 1. Ha, huh. yeah, I almost confused the poor guys back there. All right, John 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, this is important. In the beginning was the what? And the word was with, right? God, sorry. <laughs> and the word was God. Okay. 
and he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him is life, and the life was the light of men. So this is where John starts his gospel in pointing out everything begins with God. Right? Now, he goes on to say then in verse 14, and the word, now who's the word again? Okay, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What always was and has always been came and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, he is the Word. He is God. The Word became flesh and lived amongst us. And that Word, which is God, is full of grace and truth. Okay? Don't forget that. Okay. Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So John is setting up the identity of who is Jesus, the importance of Jesus, correct? Would you agree with that? So this truth, he is grace and he is truth, and it is the truth and the grace of who God is is realized through the embodiment of him in the flesh through Jesus, who lived amongst us, okay? So then he says of himself in John 14, Verses 6 through 7, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Because remember what John said earlier? Truth was, right? He is the Word. The Word was with God. The Word is God. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and is full of grace and truth. We see Jesus. We see the Father. Correct? And he says about himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. The things that we look for in this world are what? Direction? Purpose? Right? And reason for being. Yeah? Right? With every, so by what he's defining to them is everything you could potentially ever look for is in me, Jesus. Right? So when we find this world, it gets a little confusing and a little crazy. It's because they've forgotten Jesus. They've pushed out Jesus. And so when we find ourselves getting a little confused and a little upside down on things and wondering, what, yeah, what, what is the truth about this matter? Because this person makes a really great point. But then I read this thing on the internet, and it's got to be true. So that makes a great point, even though it doesn't list who actually said it. <laughs> and then this person makes a different point, and we get all twisted up, right? And so we must remember that truth is Jesus. And if truth is Jesus, then our answer is in Jesus. So he tells us then, so in verse seven, 16 of chapter 14, Jesus is telling them if, uh, before that, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. Well done. Whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So now it went from where Jesus, so God, since creation, right, now has come in the flesh and walked amongst, and Jesus is telling them, I'm about to leave, but don't you worry, I'm not leaving you as an orphan, and what I'm going to give you is now the spirit of truth, because that is his spirit. In now, that won't just be walking alongside of you, that if you're not in the region, you miss it, but that is actually willing to dwell inside of you. So that means, who in this room has access to truth? Raise your hand. Yes. Every single hand should be up because each and every one of us has now access to truth. So we're not left trying to figure it out on our own. We're not left in confusion. We're not left without a way. Correct? 
Right. So I like engagement with the crowd because I'm the director of the School of Transformation. I do a lot of teaching that way. And so preaching, I'm like, eh, I'd love, talk to me. <laughs> so sorry, if you don't like that and you'd rather just watch me, that's not going to work. <laughs> so even, even the Pharisees themselves admitted, and I have lots of verses, okay? So we're going to just, you're just going to get it. And where did I go? Come back. Oh, yes, Matthew. Matthew 22. Even the Pharisees admit this to Jesus. Okay? Now, here's what's interesting. They're actually trying to trap Jesus. They say it in verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And here's is what they say then to him. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one for you are not partial to any very nice words, right? They're like, hey, we get it. You, you are not someone that's swayed. You are truthful. You are a good teacher. And so they're trying to set him up. If you continue the story, they're trying to be like, okay, we're going to trap you in what you say because you know we know you can't lie. And so if we just word it right, we'll catch you in something that then, ha, discredits you. And if you continue reading it, he catches them because he is the way, the truth, and the life but they could recognize the truth inside of him. So what's interesting to me is that as I'm, as I'm reading through these different things and these different verses and I go, okay, so people see truth, then why is the world so confused? Why is the response to truth actually something that turns really negative? And the reason I say that is if you look at in John 8, we're going to start in verse 31. Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed him, if you continue in my word, then you truly are, or you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And I'll pause there. Does that sound good to anyone? Right? The truth will make you free. Now, remember what the truth is, yeah? Truth is? So Jesus is saying, who will make you free? He will make you free. And he, because he said that, and if you, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. So here's what their responses were. In verse 33, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now, all you got to do is read your Old Testament a little bit. And in the lineage between Abraham and when they're talking today is not true. But hey, they, they are all self-righteous sounding, aren't they? We're not slaves, a.k.a. We don't need freedom, right? That's kind of what they're getting at of like, wait, whoa, whoa. You're, you're beginning to cross the line of where you think we're slaves to something and we don't need what you're offering. Thanks. Well, he continues further. Jesus just lays it out. So he's, <laughs> Jesus answers them in verse 34. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Boom. Mic drop, right? He could just walk away with that and be like, there, chew on that for a while. And they're like, Who, what? And I mean, this is in an era where there's sacrifices for sin. So they know they do it because they sacrifice for it. And they have everything surrounding, making sure that they're pushing it off and trying to be good with God so they can be righteous Pharisees and good Jews, right? Sound familiar of how we try and do a lot of things to make sure we're good with God? And yet he says that there's this, if you sin, you're a slave to sin. A slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Hold on. Where did I say to go next? <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. Okay. Oh, yes. 40. Okay. Keeping on. Um, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do things which you have heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. <laughs> but as it is, you are seeking to kill me. Okay, can I just pause right there again? Let's go back to remember, think, not you guys back there, but in our minds, thinking back to who was he talking to again? the people who, the Jews who believed him, of the different things that he was doing, the, the, the messages he was giving them, they believed him. 
And here he throws down this challenge to them that you are actually seeking to kill me. And it's this, why? Why would they be seeking to kill him? A man who has told you truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. And he goes on to insult them a little further, but we'll skip ahead to 40, 43. Why? Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. Whatever he speaks is a, a lie. He speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Because I speak truth, you do not believe me. And the end result of that in verse 59, therefore they picked up stones to throw at him. And Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. I remember once when Jordy had shared a message about what do we do when we encounter truth, and it has stuck with me of this, when conviction comes, it seems we have one or two responses. When truth is presented and it causes us to look at ourselves and not like what we're hearing, we have one of two choices I've seen. You either hear it, feel it, hate it, get angry, and then go do the very thing that you said you weren't guilty of. All right, you want me to say that again? One response that I've seen is you hear it, you hear the truth, you feel it, you hate it, you get angry, and then you go do the very thing that you said you weren't doing. Right? <laughs> or, or there's the response in conviction where you hear it, you feel it, and then you walk through it. You walk through it, and you let it change you, and it let it humble you. This is what conviction of truth does. When truth is presented, we either pick one side or the other. And so what I felt like God was pointing out is this, when he is the truth, and he is the way and the life, and this is what we profess to be after, we can kind of get stuck, like some of these believers, in kind of getting settled into what we think was passable. I mean, <laughs> there, it's, it's not hard uh, to get aggravated by truth. And truth isn't always easy to hear, but it is always something we need to hear. I mean, you come to these church services enough times when we read out the words of Jesus, and it's like, you have to shut your ears to not get irritated, to not have the truth look you in the eyes and go, so what are you going to do? I mean, I guess there is a third option, but it's not conviction if we just passively ignore. Conviction allows this, then, what will I be convinced of? Who will convince me? Will I be convinced by the truth, which we, we just laid out beforehand, which is Jesus? Or will I be convinced by essentially being Lord of my own life, choosing what I would prefer that makes me most comfortable, and ignoring what truth is saying. He is incredibly gracious. Remember, he's full of grace. So the great thing is, is that he doesn't relent. But um, I don't think we really want to be on the side of where we don't listen to truth anymore. And I'll point that out of why. See, here we're, we're going to share a little bit about Paul's story in Romans. In Romans 1... Paul says this in uh, verse 18. Well, okay, I'm going to go a little earlier, so sorry. Uh, uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, he says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For, it was, for in it the righteous of God, righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous men shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. 
I'm going to skip down to verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over to the gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Down to 28 and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give heartily, hearty approval to those who practice them. What caused that? I skipped a bunch because there's, it's, it's Paul. He's very wordy. <laughs> but I wanted to make out the point of what's he, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteous men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They turn their back. They choose not to. They go, no, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. Now, what I realized as I was, I was reading this, I was like, you know what? I realized Paul would have a really good idea about this because Paul was once Saul. And as Saul, he heard truth. He heard truth through a man named Stephen. When the church was really booming and, and they, the apostles couldn't keep up with everything and they laid hands on some and said, you know what, these men are full of grace and truth. Let's, let's make sure that they get to do ministry. I'm paraphrasing now. And it's uh, they, Stephen gained a favor. Uh, you know, let's go to it. Okay, come on. I looked at the clock. That was my mistake. I'm going to ignore it. Are you all okay? Yeah. You sure? Okay. All right. So... All right, sorry, but this is, it's, oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, so this would be Acts 6. And the statement found approval with the whole congregation in verse 5, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Good qualifications. And Philip and other names that I'm not going to try and pronounce. All right, moving down, and verse 8. So the word had kept spreading, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some of the men that was called, uh, from what was called the synagogue of freedmen, including the Cyrians and Alexandrians and some from uh, Sicilia. <laughs> uh, sorry, it made me think of a song. Asia <laughs> rose up to and argued with Stephen. So they were there, they rose up, the, the freedmen were arguing with Stephen. And here's what's something interesting to note, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. That's good, right? So what do you do then? What do you do when you can't cope with the wisdom and you're like, no, I just want to, uh, <laughs> I don't like what you're saying. Stop. How can we make him Stop. They invented an idea. They said, then secretly, they induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they dragged him. They stirred up the people. And then they dragged him away and brought him before the council. They found a way to shut him up. And the charges laid against him, Stephen then addresses. And remember, he's full of Holy Spirit. They said his face shone like an angel, and he just lays it into them because the very thing they were accusing him of doing, that they were, they were angry with him for pointing out they were about to do. And how through their history it was, okay, you say that I'm trying to take away what Moses said. Well, here's through Abraham and Joseph and boom, boom, where you have not done what you say is so valuable to you. And it's like, oh, conviction, Right. So what do they choose to do in their conviction? Oh, they go on to stone him. 
Here's, here's some interesting words. Okay, so he, he finishes off his diatribe to them and says in verse 52, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed, the one, they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. And now they, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and began gnashing their teeth at him. I can't imagine what that looks like. But anyway, so then what happens? So then uh, they rushed him out and begin to throw stones at him with the intention of killing him. And Saul is standing by giving approval. Truth was met. And the signs and wonders were following by this truth. And this truth was met with, do not dare point the finger at us. Don't change what our system is working so well. We like our position. We like what we have. Stop. Stop what you're saying because it makes us look bad. Right? And then, okay, you won't stop. We're going to get rid of you. But it's truth. You can't get rid of truth. You can't. So then here is Saul standing there giving his approval and going, yep, and the persecution got really intense for the church after that. Saul begins this, this binge of murderous threats and chasing people down and throwing them in jail to get rid of this, this uprising that they found. These followers of the way. Remember who the way is? Right? These followers of Jesus. And Saul has this moment with Jesus on the road to Damascus as he was traveling in chapter 9 of Acts, he says, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it will be told to you what you must do. The men traveling with him stood speechless, hearing of the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And I got thinking about that. Can you imagine no longer being able to see? What will distract you? What will entertain you? What will take your mind off of the words that are reverberating in your brain? Why are you persecuting me? I can imagine. You see, he doesn't know that he's going to be healed in three days. He's just now with a consequence for his refusal of truth, action against truth, right? And now he's blind, and, and I can imagine all the images in his head because that's all you've got to look at. You remember all the things that you've done. And that plays over in his brain over and over again, night and day. And it's, Saul knows when he was talking about in Romans of these people that refuse truth and what happens as their hearts get hardened, he's experienced that side of it. He's been the enemy of God in the persecution of Jesus, in the persecution of truth. A believer. And it's the challenge that I, I keep going back to is this okay, when does truth stop? When has truth had enough of its way with us? Because he is gracious, right? He is full of grace and truth. Saul went on, he says, uh, So the Lord said to um, Ananias to go and pray for him, which, I mean, that would freak me out too if I was him. But uh, he, the Lord said to him, um, where is it? Uh, he's heard about him. Oh, here. Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. What was once a trophy in the enemy's hand, as Saul became a trophy in the Lord's hand. Paul, the gospels of which we know a lot of, and the conviction he has of, no, no, seek truth first. 
that everything he said he knew and, and used as a badge of honor, he used, he began to think of as nothing because it was just Jesus, just the truth. And so when we hear messages that cause conviction inside of us, see, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation makes it like you have no hope. You're done, too late, too bad, so sad. And yet here is Saul who really should have been too late, too bad, so sad. And yet, no, he's my chosen instrument. The Lord has a plan, but he's looking for those who are willing to respond to truth, to himself, and allow truth to change them, humble them. Yeah, it doesn't always feel nice, but the reason he does it is because the things that you held on to as truth were not real. Wouldn't you rather know what's real than what's not? Wouldn't you rather be led in the way rather than lost in your own? Right? And this is what he offers us. And so this world is spouting a lot of mistruths, a lot of things intended to confuse and draw you away from Jesus. Stand on guard, my friends. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You find the truth in the words of Jesus. You find the truth in those who live a life that is is dedicated to him and you can see it in how they respond. Stephen was full of truth. You could see it in how he, he carried himself and he was full of the Holy Spirit, which was the spirit of truth. If truth is everything and it's not swayed based off of what opinion is, let's do that. And if it makes you uncomfortable, Know that growth is coming, that it's going to be okay if you continue to walk forward because he doesn't leave you as an orphan. He will walk through it with you. He will lead you in the way and he will bring you out the other side so that you can rightly know his heart. You can rightly see the way he sees. And that that disgusting list I read in, in Romans, it will have no part of you. No part of you. So if there's things that God has in in the messages or in your quiet time with the Lord that he's been, hey, do we really need to continue with this? And you want to go, no, 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 that's just me. (laughs) Would you be willing to just bring it back up to him and go, Lord, is this you? Is this you? If this is you, then I want to stick with truth. And I don't really understand what to do, but you will lead me. Because I want to trust in you more than myself. Yeah? Yeah. I want to trust in him more than this failing world around me. Because it will pass away, but he remains because he has always been and always will be. Thank you for watching the Father's House Oroville YouTube channel. But don't stop there. Please subscribe to our channel and help us spread the message of Jesus to all your friends and family by sharing our videos. You can also help support us financially by clicking the Give button. Thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you again soon.